Ah, the 80s. The years of big hair, big clothes statements, big weddings, big bands, big money, big movies and not so big computers. This time on Al's Geek Lab we visit the games of 1983, a certain advancement on the years gone by. So get your seat belts fastened, your thermal boots heated, your watch turned to swatch time and your game on as we visit the top 10 PC games of 1983. At number 10 on our list then is Joust. Now Joust is a strange one. You're on some sort of bird, perhaps an ostrich, and you are amongst many other ostrich dwelling folk. And basically what you've got to do, I would have thought that you'd have to joust them as in poke them with a stick, but Effectively what you've got to do is land on them, crush the other dudes on the ostriches and pick up their eggs. Um, and then the ostriches fly off because the dudes are gone. You pick up the egg, which gives you a bonus of a thousand points. And oh, by the way, the eggs can hatch and there's little dudes that come out of them with joust sticks. Don't... that logic that doesn't make much sense to me. But anyway... Here's a fun fact for you, by the way, just in case you were wondering, totally unrelated to the review of this game, an ostrich egg is about the size of 23 chicken eggs. Anyway, moving quickly on, the game itself has a little bit of gravity, so when you fly your wings up, the Earth's gravitational pull will pull you back down. That's pretty good, um, so it certainly adds a little dynamic to the game. As the games level on, or you have new waves, the, the game gets a little bit harder because the the bottom of the landing pad, I guess, it opens up a little bit more and underneath that landing pad there is liquid hot magma. And uh, if you fall into the liquid hot magma, you will die and that's not good. So yes, it gets a bit trickier as you move along the waves and uh, yeah, that's, that's the main gist to joust. The graphics, the downside to the game, is the graphics, it's, um, the graphics flicker a lot, which is annoying. And sometimes the controls are a bit finicky and the game is a bit slow. So when you press a button, there is a delay. And so you have to factor that in. So it gets the 10 position purely because the graphics are flickery and because the actions aren't quite in time. So other than that, it's a very playable game. I enjoyed it quite a lot. In at number 9 is probably the most retarded sort of sound of game ever, it's called Spider. Okay, so the general idea of this game, it's not very involved, you have to kill the spiders with frickin' laser beams! And if you miss them, you can stomp them on the ground with your shoes. It's also possible to shoot their little web thing that they're coming down on, and that means they'll come down faster. The sound is, um, well the sound is very annoying, but it's also like, when it gets faster and faster and faster, it just makes you start sweating. It's really good fun. It looks stupid, the graphics suck, the, you know, the sound's annoying, but I gotta tell you, it's fun. So, it gets number nine. In at number 8 is Centipede. You've probably played this game before, maybe in the arcades or on the Atari or something like that, and this gameplay is pretty much no different. There are different versions of Centipede for the IBM, and this is pretty much the original. It's good. The sound is ooh, average, it's a bit annoying, but it is definitely decent short-term fun. The game isn't 100% true to its original arcade version, there's a crazy spidery thing that comes and tries to get you, but the same idea is there, the centipede comes from the top of the screen and worms its way down and you blast it to bits. Obviously if you smash it in the middle you're going to have two big centipedes, if you smash it along the end of it then you're going to have little centipedes. And obviously the more mushrooms that are on the screen the harder it gets. So every time you blast a bit off the old centipede it turns into a mushroom, naturally. But anyway, it's quite good fun, um, it's, it's a classic and you'll not find any problems picking this up for a little while and playing it to your heart's content before dropping it in absolute boredom. That, my ladies and gentlemen, is Centipede. 
in at number seven on our little review is Moon Patrol. This one was fairly unique for its time and you're going to see the next game up at number six is pretty much the only one which was similar. But Moon Patrol was nice, the graphics were nice and colourful for its time. Uh, you had to bounce along the top of the moon I guess and it has some mountains on it and then there's lots of funky little bushy things on there but the interesting thing is you can shoot up and along as well which keeps the game quite interesting. There are 26 checkpoints A through Z you'll probably see the letters on the top right E J O T Z and you can see them when you go past them on the bottom of the screen and as you go through those zones you get uh, more difficult baddies and more difficult scenarios colors change and all that good stuff it is pretty tricky so getting through there easily is not something for the faint-hearted and that does keep the gameplay a little bit more interesting and in fact you can see in this video I didn't get very far indeed I do quite like the story. The player takes the role of Luna City police officer assigned to Sector 9, the home of the toughest thugs in the galaxy. And um, that's the story. Now at the end of a stage the time spent compared to the average and bonus points are awarded accordingly. At a thousand plus one hundred per second bettered, completing an entire course gives an additional five thousand points plus one hundred per second bettered all sounds very mathematical to me. There are two unique courses, the beginner course and the champion course. The champion course, of course, loops forever. There is actually an end to this game. You can kill the last patrol car. So yes, theoretically you can keep coming back for more on this game, which means that it's firmly in the place of seventh position here on our top 10 of 1983. They really did like using the word space in every game in the early 80s, but this particular game was actually quite novel. I did enjoy it quite a lot and that's why it gets the coveted sixth position in this review. Great fun, too short. Um, the idea is that you pick up some ore to get some money and then you can fend off aliens whilst you're at it. Now. There are other little twirly things which give you fuel. As you can see at the top right of the screen, your fuel is depleted as much as you move about. So the idea is, you know, it's got a multiple dynamic here where you can kill the baddies and fill up your fuel and pick up the ore so that you can sell it at the end of the level. At the end of the level, you'll be picked up by something that looks awfully familiar to the Star Trek NCC-1701. Pure coincidence, I'm sure. But um, once you've been picked up, there's a little calculation that's made to find out just how much of that ore you've picked up. And of course, your score is based on how much ore you have. And this is because humanity's hunger for material resources has expanded beyond Earth's capacity to satisfy it. Sound familiar? Anyway, you've been sent on this mining expedition in space because of course there's just lots of random ore flying about in space. So you might be wondering at this point why oh why is it number 6 on the list? This looks like a great game, the graphics are pretty decent, the play is action packed and fun, so why is it position number 6? Well the biggest reason is its lack of levels. Doesn't matter what difficulty setting you play it on, there are only 3 levels. So the longevity of this game is rather short. So for that reason and that reason only, it's at number 6. Okay, let me tell you if you've heard this story before. Space aliens that come down to invade the Earth and you in your ship are the only one that can stop them. Some might say these are space invaders. Yeah, okay, so this is Space Commanders for the IBM PC nonetheless. Now it's in four color CGA mode, but they have a very good use of the on-screen palette. And of course, if you know anything about CGA, you could get the horrible purpley cyany white color, and you could also get the greeny, browny, red and blue color. So they've used both of those color palettes interchangeably in this game. It's a fantastic port of Space Invaders. I found it very playable. Um, it's got some nice sound, nice graphics. Um, it's been done well by Columbia Data Products. And for that reason, it got the number five spot on the review. 
Putting Load Runner at number 4 on the top 10 list was a very difficult decision indeed. Now, Softline in 1983 praised Load Runner, calling it smooth, thoughtful and quite addictive, and the game went on to succeed and have accolades all the way through into 1989. It was the second best-selling Commodore game of late 1987, and sales had surpassed 250,000 copies by November 1989. There are many great things about Load Runner, and I don't know where to start. So first things first, I will say to you that this game was the first game ever that allowed you to have an editor. So you could actually go into a separate part of the game and make your own levels. That was pretty cool for back in the day. Now, anyway, back to the gameplay. There are lots of little elements to this game that will keep you coming back for a long, long time. It is, however, incredibly frustrating. Now, you see those little things that look like microwaves on the screen, well apparently, and I say apparently because I've got no idea about it, but those half human size boxes are actually bars of gold. So you, the idea is you've got to pick up all of those bars of gold and these these baddies or blue guys or whatever they are, they drop behind them these bars of gold. Don't quite know why, what the logic is to that one, but they do. And you've got to pick them all up. And then once you are in the position where you've got all of the gold, you can then leave the level. So that sounds pretty easy. The only thing is that those little guys sometimes come after you. Now you can go up ladders, you can go over monkey bars, you can even jump off walls to an extent and things will be okay for you. But if you want to stop them in their tracks when they're close to you, you've got some sort of digging apparatus. And yes, if you press the to the left key or to the right key, you can dig holes to each direction. And dumbest guys ever, they fall into these holes and then you can just walk nicely over their heads. Now if you fall into one of your traps, you'll kill yourself. But if you, they walk into one of your traps, well, they don't die. They'll come out of that trap in a few seconds and they're back in the load running game again. There are 150 levels in Load Runner, plenty to keep you occupied. Suffice it to say, I'm pretty rubbish at this game and I only managed to get to level 2 or 3, so I'm not really going to go very far, but I will say that later on in the levels you will find things like trapdoors and bedrock that you cannot dig through. But also quite interesting is the amount of puzzles that goes into it, so when you get to a particular part you might have to dig diagonally to get down to the bit of gold. So there are things in there which actually require a little bit more intuition rather than just the old point and shoot of many other games of the time. Some of the puzzles are even time sensitive. There's an awful lot of things that are going on in this game and it never fails to keep you amused for hours and hours and hours. In fact, the only thing to save your sanity in this game would be a save option. It was incredibly difficult to give Load Runner the fourth position in this review, make no bones about it, but it had to be at number four because we've got some classics coming up. Now, the next one is Fleet Sweep, also made by the same company that brought us Spider earlier on in this review, Mirror Images Software. Now, this one looks pretty basic. You think, oh, this is going to be a bit average when you start it up, but then it gets quite exciting. Now, okay, it's another alien shooting bust em up, but it has a bit more going for it. Now, you can start with um, different difficulty levels. With the beginner level, you can start at zone 0 with 0 points. The novice one will start you at zone 10 with 2,000 points. The advanced one will start at zone 20 with 4,000 points. And of course, the experts will start at zone 30 with 6,000 points. Now, the idea is that you shoot the baddies, of course, but the extra dynamic in this game is that you have a limited amount of fuel. So when you shoot the spaceship uh, that has the big ball on it, if you make sure you just shoot the spaceship and not the ball, then the ball will fly down towards you and uh, the ball will help you refuel your ship. There are plenty of levels to keep you interested and this one gets harder and harder the first 29 levels 
all have different attack formations and uh, different baddies as well to keep you guessing. After that the baddies do repeat but the game continues to add extra uh, difficulty through the speed of the game. They appear from not just the top but also from the bottom to just to keep you guessing. So it really is quite a cool game, I enjoyed it an awful lot and I'm sure if you download it you will too. The next one gets in at number two. Again, quite a controversial one, very difficult to get us down at this narrow end of the review, but Serpentine made it to this position. It was released in 1982, but didn't make it to the PC until early 1983, so it narrowly gets in to this particular review. Now, it was written by David Snyder and published by Broder Bund and has a very similar feel to the Konami game Jungler which was released the previous year. Now the idea of the game sounds fairly straightforward. You are in your little protected zone to begin with. You go out and there are other serpents on the screen. Those ones are baddies and they're red in colour. Now you go after these baddie snakes and if you go up their backsides you can chomp away at them and if you continue on up their backsides you can chomp the whole thing up. Every bit of their backside that you chomp you get bigger in length. Oh yes. Now once you've got all the way up and you've eaten all of the serpents you win the level which is great. At some points in the game you will see that a little green frog arrives. If you chew up this frog, poor little guy, you will become longer as well. And likewise the other snakes on the game, they can also eat this frog increasing their length. So it's a battle to get the frog. Now unlike many games around this period of time, you couldn't double back on yourself. But in this game you can actually press the back key. So if you've committed to going in a certain direction and you decide to change your mind, press the back key and you can go back on, on yourself. Which is a strange look, uh, but it's doable so I'm not going to complain. To gain an extra life in the game is quite interesting. At some point you're going to lay an egg, now that's going to take a slice of you off and if that egg is still on the screen at the end of the level then the egg hatches and of course there's an extra life, naturally. Although be warned, that little frogger, he's come back and he can eat that egg. So I guess something in life was good for the frog. P.S. How many of you know of frogs that eat eggs. Answers on the back of a postcard please. The game is incredibly addictive. I would challenge anybody who plays this game not to be able to say oh I can't put this one down. It's not boring, it's a great game. The only problem I have with it really is the controls. They'd certainly take a bit of getting used to. A, Z, K, L are the keys to play the game. So this game goes firmly in my keep pile. I'll be making sure that I play this many, many more times. But this is firmly in the second position on our review. At the coveted number one spot of the games on the IBM PC of 1983 is two games. <laughs> one of the games is Jaybird and the other one is called Digger. Let's have a look at Jaybird first. So Jaybird is basically a conversion of the arcade game Qbert and the object of the game is to change all of the tiles in the pyramid to a target colour which it tells you up front. The uh, Jaybird himself or herself, I don't know what its sex is but it's lovely, he's a little cute guy, oh love him and uh, he has to go all over these tiles as I say um, in later levels you'll find out that he has to go over each tile twice and um, on the sides of the pyramid of tiles you find little angely wings and they'll take you to the top of the pyramid just in case there's a baddie. And talking about baddies, there are multiple different baddies. There are snakes and balls and of course yeah, nasty balls, I mean who wants them in your life? Right, so you've got all these things, they're coming after you, you need to get away from them so you can change the colours of the pyramid thing. All in all, Jaybird is a lovely little game, it's great fun, it will keep you going back for more, um, and yeah, make sure you play it. Now the second game which is at number one is Digger. 
Now, Digger came out in 1983 by Canadian developer Windmill Software, as did with many other great games of the era. Now, if you've played Mr. Do or Dig Dug in the arcades, then Digger won't feel dissimilar. The big difference with Digger over Dig Dug is that you're not got a puka thing, you're not blowing up the baddies. However, You'd think that that would make it lesser of a game than Dig Dug. Oh no. No, you have a lot faster paced um, addictive fun here. You make uh, little roads with your digging tractory thing and you've got to get those gems. As you're digging along, you make roads. Now these little baddie, I, I've got no idea what they're called, but they're, they're monsters. And um, apparently they're called nobbins. I had to look that one up, but... <laughs> nobbins. Anyway, when you dig your roads, you'll find out that the nobbins can come after you too. So uh, you've got to be careful about which roads you dig. Now, for the observant of you out there, you may notice that there are big bags of gold or money kicking around. Now, if you go under one of those bags of money and there is a bit for the bag to fall, it will fall to the bottom and make a blocky thing, which I believe is a block of gold. And you can go and dig that gold up and make yourself some money. So go do that. But the other interesting thing about those bags of money is that when they fall, they can fall on the nobbins, which will crush your little nobbins. So that's good. Coming back once again to the nobbins, later on in the game the nobbins can turn into hobbins, which is much less fun because they have the power to excavate, just like yourself, and they can destroy emeralds and gold bags whilst doing so. Never a good thing. Another fun fact is that Whilst you're playing this game, cherries will appear. So if you want to pop your cherry, go ahead and what will happen is that the monsters will now run away from you, the digger, rather than towards you. So this is kind of like Pac-Man when you get that big pill. To finish the level, either kill all the baddies, or better yet, get all the emeralds on the screen. Now the year of course was 1983 and most people had a CGA display so the number of colours on screen weren't that great but if you look at the palette involved in this game you'll see that the colours are fantastic, they're bright, they're vibrant and on top of it the sound was fantastic. During the normal gameplay popcorn is used as a background music in bonus mode the overture to William Tell by Guaccino Rossini plays. If the player dies then a short rendition of Frédéric Chopin's Piano Sonata No. 2 in B flat minor of course, also known as the Funeral March, is played accompanied with a picture of an RIP gravestone. Digger used a pulse width modulation sound system which was unusual and very advanced for its time so it did sound really good. So let's just have it there. Great gameplay, great sound, great graphics, all for its time, great game. Definitely number one stuff. Now if you haven't had a chance to look at the videos which I covered for the original two years of the IBM PC's history, 1981 and 1982, you'll see that 1983 really was a marked advance in gaming. Of course you had the CGA colour graphics adapter and you basically had a lot of games which had taken advantage of all of the facets of that colour and graphics. There were a great many games which came out in this year and I downloaded probably about 30 games in order to play these um, so it wasn't an easy decision to come up with the top 10. Indeed there are plenty of games which didn't make this top 10 quite but were also very noteworthy. Games such as 3 Demon which was really good fun. Basically the idea is you go around a 3D maze. It feels a bit reminiscent of Wolfenstein 3D uh, although it's in CGA. Anyway, the gameplay is to go around picking up bars of gold and as you do, little ghosties come and get you. There are strange square types of gold which might not be gold. Anyway, these ghosties that come and get you, when you go over that, the ghosties run away from you, just kind of like Pac-Man. So it's quite good fun, gets a bit boring after a while, and navigation is also quite difficult, but certainly quite novel for its time. 
Starmax was another game which kind of felt similar to Defender, although in my opinion was a lot more playable, you could adjust the speed in a much more nuanced way, and yeah, it was a bit more addictive than uh, Defender in my opinion, although the graphics weren't quite as good. The Atari classic Battlezone also didn't make it quite into the top 10, although it was quite a close call for me. Um, I did enjoy the 3D wireframe graphics and the gameplay, well, it's strangely addictive. It's a bit difficult sometimes to tell if the enemy is shooting at you or you're shooting at them, but it's all, it's all good fun. In this year also Frogger was released and uh, Frogger was, well, it was a MS Basic game and the coding was so bad that the collision detection really didn't work at all and the gameplay was too fast to be unplayable and yes I've tried it outside of an emulator it just didn't work very well so Frogger didn't even get a look in however there was a game called Foul Play which was the general same idea but it had another kind of level to it and the gameplay was much better so Foul Play definitely had a, a, a little look in over Frogger also of interest is Minor 49er. Your character is Bounty Bob and um, the, the name Minor 49er comes from the gold rush of 1849 but that's about all that is 1849-esque. As you go through the mines you search for the evil Yukon Johan uh, whilst avoiding radioactive creatures that inhabit the mine. They look awfully like space invaders, but there you go. Bounty Bob walks over a selection of flooring. It fills up with colour to say that you've gone over it. It's important to go over all of the floors and that will complete the level. There's 10 levels in this game, or 10 mines, and that's quite a lot for that sort of period of time. So it was quite an advanced game. It's it's it looks easy, but playing it, it's actually really difficult. The collision detection isn't quite friendly to the game player. I guess with a bit of practice, you could get quite good at it. For completeness sake, I'm going to mention Ms. Pac-Man, which is the cutesy version of Pac-Man with a little bow in her hair. The IBM port of Ms. Pac-Man is pretty true to the original. The only problem I had with it is that in normal Pac-Man when you press the down arrow or the up arrow it will take the next opportunity to turn up or down as you expect and this game you have to be right above or below the corridor in order to go up it or down it by pressing the key so that that slight nuance for me was enough to make me like the game less than it should be liked plus everyone's played Pac-Man I'll also give a tip of the hat to Galaxian, which is a kind of Galaga clone. The biggest problem with Galaxian is the fact that it has slow gameplay, flickery graphics, otherwise it's not too pants a version, definitely playable. Another mention is Sea Dragon, very tricky game. Naturally you have to blow up everything in sight, which includes well, hot air balloons on the bottom and gun turrets on the top, but anyway. Uh, you have an up shoot and a right shoot, which is like the moon buggy game. One of the things that makes it interesting is the fact that your air runs out, as well as the multi-direction shooting to add to the on-screen action. Then there's Pango, which is a clone of the arcade game Pango. The idea is to kick these ice blocks into the baddies as you move around. The idea of the game is to clear all the baddies from the playfield in about a minute by either squashing them with ice blocks or shocking them by pushing the walls at the edges of the screen. Although some seasoned game players may find it enjoyable, I found Pango extremely frustrating. Now this game could almost have been in the top 10, it's Dig Dug. Everybody knows Dig Dug and Atari made the conversion over to the PC in 83. Dig Dug it's great, you're Puka, you go around and you blow up baddies by using your little zappery thing. It's great fun for all the family, the PC conversion isn't actually that great, the collision detection is a bit off, the graphics are slow and it's, it's not super fun. It's, it's the same game but not as good, so dig dug, yeah, probably a number 11 or 12 in the game rating. And that just leaves me to say that, of course, like every other game of the early P3 
PC era, there were a good number of adventure or text adventure games and The Hobbit and also Rogue were uh, no exceptions to those as well. Lots of fun with Rogue um, which spawned a whole genre of roguelike games and of course The Hobbit had a graphical element as well of course as the text adventure itself. So that's it, that's my roundup of the games of 1983. What do you think? Do you vehemently disagree? Or do you think that my games are entirely accurate and should definitely be the top 10? Either way, if I've missed something out or you think I'm an idiot, then let me know in the comments. I love your comments, good and bad and indifferent. But most importantly, of course, is your subscribing. If you could subscribe if you like my content, that would be lovely. I do enjoy it when that subscribe number goes up every single time it goes up. Ah, lovely. All right, guys, that's it for this time. I will join you again in 1984, where we have yet more top 10 goodness. Until then, keep gaming away and be excellent to each other. Thanks for watching. I'll be back. <laughs>